On a bright summer day, an unimaginable crime horrified California. A young girl was snatched from her neighborhood by an unknown assailant. Hundreds of officials and volunteers combed acres of farmland searching for the missing girl. The FBI soon joined the hunt, hoping that a quick response would improve the odds of finding her before her young life was extinguished. On July 2nd, 1994, a 12-year-old girl was abducted from her home in Northern California. Based on experience, the FBI had learned the hard lessons. Act fast, search wide, enlist volunteers. But as the hours slipped by, agents also realized their chances for recovering her alive grew slim. I'm Jim Kallstrom, former head of the FBI's New York office. Agents and local law enforcement needed to scour miles of rugged terrain to find the girl before it was too late. The small city of Lodi, California is nestled in the heart of the Golden State's warm Central Valley, just south of Sacramento. It is surrounded by some of the world's richest farmland, orchards and renowned vineyards. Most who settled here found Lodi's tranquility and low crime rate preferable to the frenzied pace of larger cities. On Saturday, July 2nd, 1994, three of its younger residents escaped the heat of the day in front of the television. A 16-year-old girl was watching her young sister and her sister's friend. The girl's parents were away in Michigan for the long 4th of July weekend. At about 4 p.m., a visitor stopped by. A shirtless man covered in tattoos was inquiring about the house which was posted for sale. He asked if he could come in to check out the place. The teenager told him to call the realtor's number on the sign and to make an appointment when her parents returned in a few days. The man said he didn't have a pen and asked if he could come in to write it down. Wisely, the girl refused to let him in and offered to write it down for him instead. On a piece of her father's stationery, she jotted down the realtor's number. She handed it to the stranger who left reluctantly. I'm sorry. No, come on. Hi, I'd like to go on a cameo. A large half pepperoni. Since it was getting close to dinner time, uh -huh. the older sister called to order a pizza. The closest takeout place was 10 minutes away. Girls, I'm going to get a pizza. I'll be the back. The girls didn't want to leave their movie, so the teenager let them stay. She'd only be gone 20 minutes. <laughs> Leaving the children alone for such a short time didn't seem too risky. Just moments after she left, the doorbell rang again. Maybe your sister forgot her keys. The young sister answered it. Hi, I was here a little bit ago, a little earlier. I the shirtless man had returned. Give me a phone number, and I just want to know if I can borrow a phone book. The girl went to fetch him a phone book yeah. from the kitchen. Moments later, the older sister returned home with the pizza. She called to the younger girls, girls but they did not answer. Got pizza! 
With a knife to her throat, the shirtless man attacked her. He forced the teenager upstairs to a bedroom where the younger girls were already tied up. Like the others, he secured her hands and feet. None of them knew what would happen next. Trembling, the young friend felt the intruder pull the knot from her ankles. Then he dragged her out of the room. In a second bedroom down the hall, the man threw his young victim onto the bed, threatening to kill her and her friends if she screamed. He bound her feet again. Then left the room. While alone, the young girl tried to work free from her restraints. For the sisters, their situation appeared hopeless. After a few grueling moments, the friend managed to free her hands. But the bindings around the friend's legs tripped her when she tried to stand up. She heard the man's footsteps and her friend's cries coming down the hall. The girl slipped into an open closet. Dragging the younger sister, the man burst into the room. He didn't see the friend lying motionless in a recess on the closet's back wall. The tattooed man had no idea where the girl could have gone. Hearing no more movement, the girl's friend risked leaving the safety of her hiding place. The intruder likely figured the child had managed to escape and call the cops. Since he had lost control of one of his three hostages, he decided to focus on only one. The kidnapper forced the young sister into the family's car and sped off. The girl who had hidden in the closet found the older sister in the room next door and untied her. The teenager called 911 and reported that a tattooed man had abducted her sister, taking their red sports car. The information was relayed to Lodi officers who sped to the home. A quick response was essential, since the chances of finding an abducted minor alive greatly decreased after the first 24 hours. Lodi Police Chief Larry Hansen was called in right away to take charge of the case. The agony of, of having your child taken is a, a fear of every parent. I think it's a fear of every community. You know, we want our children to be safe, and we particularly want them to be safe in our own homes. So it is the worst type of violation that can occur to have a child kidnapped out of a home. Officers attempted to contact the girl's parents in Michigan, but they were not immediately reachable. Their parents were vacationing in a remote cabin, so Michigan deputies were sent to inform them of their daughter's abduction. 
The two girls left in the house were taken to a hospital for an examination before they could be interviewed. Police dispatched all points bulletins for the sports car's license plate and a description of the missing child. My greatest fear was that this case was going to end up like so many others, that we would have a homicide. You, you, you try not to focus on that, but you recognize time is really of the essence. And that individual kidnapped that little girl for a specific reason, a reason that we were only speculating, but he knew in his mind and heart what he was going to do. And so we were just trying to do everything we could to recover her as quickly as possible and hopefully avoid that. The chief wasted no time in calling in the FBI. Special Agent Charles Riley of the FBI Sacramento Field Office knew he had to act quickly if there was any hope of finding the young girl. Sometimes the kidnappings go interstate and sometimes they don't. The problem is we don't know, and if you wait until you know there's an interstate uh, nexus to the crime, sometimes it's pretty late in the game to get good information. So we generally jump early on a kidnapping. By 8 p.m., more than an hour after the child was taken from her home, Crime scene technicians from the FBI's evidence recovery team and the California Department of Justice processed the rooms where the girls had been held captive. For the next 12 hours, they collected hairs and fibers throughout the house. Technicians also dusted surfaces for fingerprints. They hoped that trace evidence left behind could help identify the unknown perpetrator. an interesting thing. This one piece will make 52 layers. Watch on mobile devices or the big screen. All for free. No subscription required. At the hospital, the missing girl's older sister and friend, though still shaken, told a Lodi detective they had never seen their attacker before. The girls described him as 5'7", tan, and muscular with many tattoos. They also provided detail of the terrifying events that had occurred just a few hours earlier. The younger girl said that she felt scared when her friend didn't respond to her calls after she'd left the room to answer the door. The girl found her in the kitchen, with a man holding a knife to her throat. Instinctively, the girl tried to protect her friend. But the man was too powerful. He forced both girls out of the kitchen to the bedrooms upstairs. And then the older girl when she arrived moments later. The girl said he threatened to kill them if they didn't do as he demanded. They feared what he might have already done to the girl who he'd taken. As the only witnesses, they would need to give more detail to a sketch artist as soon as they were released from the hospital's care. For residents of Northern California, this crime was unfortunately all too familiar. Less than a year earlier, a 12-year-old Petaluma girl named Polly Class had also been kidnapped and was later found murdered. Our case had such eerie similarities to the Polly Class case. There were three girls in the home in our case. There were three girls in the home of the polyclass case. Both suspects were armed with a knife. Both suspects took a girl and left the home with them. Though polyclass's murderer was already behind bars, police hoped that the outcome of their current case would not prove as tragic. Lodi investigators called upon the polyclass foundation for help. Created after Polly's death, the foundation assists law enforcement with disseminating information on child abductions as quickly as it develops. It was one of the first phone calls that I made. I contacted them because they have resources to assist in this type of investigation that we do not. They have their own network system. They have 24-hour um, gas stations and 24-hour convenient type stores that they will um, fax you know, copies of a flyer and those will be posted so that if people are traveling through, 
you know, they can be aware of this particular incident. At the Lodi police station, the girls provided a description of the suspect to a sketch artist. As they had told police at the crime scene, each of the perpetrator's upper arms were covered in tattoos. And in the middle of his back, the man bore the unfinished outline of a skull's face. He had blonde hair, blue eyes, a mustache, and a scruffy beard. Okay. Investigators sent the sketch to every law enforcement agency and media outlet in the area. 20 miles away on a desolate road in the rural area of San Joaquin County. A rancher was on his way home at about 8.30 p.m. when he noticed a brush fire in one of his pastures. Just beyond, he saw a sports car, apparently abandoned, with its doors left open. He called 911. firemen were first to arrive on the scene. A brush fire in the arid region of Northern California can spread quickly with devastating results. They were able to contain the blaze to an isolated area before it reached the red sports car. San Joaquin Sheriff's Lieutenant Mike Padilla arrived moments later. We received a radio call that there was a, uh, a fire, and it was a suspicious fire. A uh, fire was on scene, and there was a vehicle abandoned in the area. When we saw the car, it did fit the description that was being aired um, uh, on a Be on the Lookout by Lodi Police. It, it, it was very similar to that vehicle. Uh, we were, when we finally got close enough to read the tags on the car, we called them in to our records division. They were able to confirm that was the vehicle. The car had apparently sparked the fire as it careened through the ranch's field before it was halted by debris. But police found no signs of her or her abductor. They could only hope that they were close by and that the girl was still alive. By 8.30 p.m. on July 2nd, 1994, an hour and a half after a girl was abducted from her Lodi, California home in a stolen car, Investigators had found the vehicle in a burning pasture of rural San Joaquin County. The girl and her kidnapper were nowhere to be found. San Joaquin Sheriff's Lieutenant Mike Padilla was joined by police from neighboring Lodi and the FBI. The Lodi uh, lieutenant arrived and met with us on the scene. Um, it was at that point that um, we determined that there's a possibility that our victim might be in the luggage area of the vehicle. Although it's a small vehicle, um, it would be large enough to put a, a small female in. The keys were missing, so firefighters carefully cut the hatchback's lock. They heard no banging or screaming and feared what they might find. The luggage compartment was empty. Though they found nothing in or near the vehicle to indicate the subject's present whereabouts, the car had become the nexus of the search, according to FBI Special Agent Charles Riley. We didn't know whether the victim and the subject were close to the car or their location. We were acting upon the premise that they could still be very close. Our highest concern was to find the victim safely and uh, also to find the subject if we could. Since the area was so remote, it was unlikely that the assailant had stolen another vehicle and left the area. Yet because he was probably on foot, there was a greater possibility that he had disposed of his 12-year-old victim in order to move more swiftly through the rugged terrain. Lodi Police Lieutenant Gerald Murray was aware that the odds of finding her alive were beginning to dwindle. Statistically, Usually a victim does not live very long once uh, they get in a rural setting and the suspect has control and this, like it is in this type of situation. So, you know, we were very, very concerned about her living through this experience and um, basically we had to focus on what we did know. And what we did know is we had the resources, we had the training, and we had the personnel that were going to diligently search and look for this person. 
By 8.45 p.m., the FBI and local police had helicopters on the scene. From above, they would help guide investigators to the girl or her abductor if they were spotted. In order to penetrate the blackness of the landscape, the pilots relied on forward-looking infrared detection, or FLIR. FLIR is a sophisticated heat sensing device that illuminates anything radiating heat, including people or the engine of a car. On the ground, canine units were called upon for assistance. Investigators hoped they could follow the subject's scents to indicate the direction they may have headed. The dogs led the searchers into the brush, but after about a mile, the trail turned cold. It didn't take long for San Joaquin Sheriff's Lieutenant Mike Padilla to realize that to cover such a wide rural expanse, they would need far more personnel. Although we're a larger department than Lodi, uh, this was even too broad of an area for us uh, to handle alone. So we uh, activated mutual aid, which is something we do in California. We can activate as many counties as we need to, to receive assistance. In this case, I believe we, we activated 10 counties, um, and uh, the response was astounding. The San Joaquin County Sheriff's also dispatched their mobile command center bus to help coordinate the massive search. The bus would act as the field headquarters to receive and disseminate the most current information and to pass out assignments for the interagency effort. It could be moved anywhere at a moment's notice if necessary. San Joaquin sheriffs and fire departments provided road and topographical maps of the entire region. Their familiarity with the area would be an invaluable resource to assist the FBI and Lodi police in containing two square miles, the maximum distance they could handle with limited personnel. Their first task was to set up a perimeter, as FBI Special Agent Charles Riley recalls. We didn't know the time frame uh, from when the car first arrived until we were there looking for the victim and the subject. So we uh, tried to set up a perimeter on a spot we could function on. In this case, we chose roads uh, circumventing the area where the car was found. And unfortunately, those roads were a great distance. It was in excess of a, of a mile in every direction around the car, and we had to try and run a perimeter to uh, make sure no one left that area. California Highway Patrol units, San Joaquin Sheriff's deputies, and the Lodi police conducted rolling and stationary surveillance along major routes into and out of the area. The perimeter stretched like mile-long spokes of a wheel emanating from the abandoned car on the ranch. Several helicopters remained in the air, hoping to glimpse the young girl or the fugitive with their infrared radar. Within the perimeter, Teams of searchers began to canvas the homes and ranches scattered amongst the hilly terrain. They considered the possibility that the suspect may know someone in the region. Agents and officers provided a description of the kidnapper and his victim and asked homeowners if they had seen anything unusual in the past hour. They found no one who had, and most were surprised to learn of the extensive manhunt. Uh, with the assistance of deputies from the Calaveras County Sheriff's Department, we were able to assign them to do basically a property-to-property -property search to, first of all, search all the structures on that property, second of all, account for all the vehicles, farm equipment, ATVs, that sort of thing, and also to inform the residents there of what was going on in the event that they would see the victim or suspect. There were many outbuildings and barns located a short distance from the abandoned car. Landowners directed officers and agents to where they were located and allowed them to search every structure. Over the next two hours, dozens of teams found no trace of the tattooed man or the young girl. Because the area was vast, officers fastened yellow ribbons to structures at the front of the properties they had been to, so the next group would know that the location had been searched. But as thorough as the teams were, the uneven terrain favored the suspect. As the teams would come back, would ask them, in the area that you searched, is it possible for someone to be hiding in there? And unfortunately, oftentimes they said, it's possible. He would have to sit still, 
sit quiet and sit hidden, but it's very possible. By 11 p.m., over four hours since the girl had been taken from her home, searchers still had no way of knowing if the child was alive or dead, and no indication if she or her abductor were still in the area. Investigators hoped that alerting the public at large on the 11 o'clock news would prompt leads. Lodi Police Chief Larry Hansen held a press conference and faced questions from the community, including his own children. I have five children. My youngest was five years old at the time, and she was aware that this kidnapping incident had occurred. And she saw me on television. She was talking to my wife, asking questions. You know, has, uh, have they found uh, the little girl? Have they found the little girl? Unfortunately, the chief's wife had to tell their daughter that they had not. And as the hours increased from the time of her abduction, survival for the missing girl did not seem likely. By 5 a.m. on July 3rd, 1994, more than 10 hours had passed since a Lodi, California girl was abducted from her home. The FBI and a dozen local law enforcement agencies maintained a two-square-mile perimeter in rural San Joaquin County, where they believed her kidnapper had fled with her the previous evening. Over a hundred officials, including Lodi Police Lieutenant Gerald Murray, grappled with what to do next as they faced devastating uncertainty. We were really concerned. I mean, do we even still have them in the area? Uh, are we wasting our time here? Are they south of Highway 26 and we've missed them? You know, is he going to further victimize her? Is he going to uh, commit a homicide? Is What's he going to do? Uh, is he going to go to a house and abduct another victim or get another hostage? You have all these emotional things going on in your mind, and how can we best and humanly you know, prevent that? As the search continued in the farming region, a team of Lodi police and FBI agents remained at the expanded command center in the Lodi library. They coordinated dozens of incoming officials and volunteers who wanted to assist. FBI Special Agent Charles Riley helped direct the search effort. How old do you think she was? Well, the search was organized, breaking everybody into uh, small teams and then assigning the teams to sectors of the search. I think it was at least four or five persons per team so they could spread out and cover an area. And we would assign areas, uh, usually adjacent to each team, to only cover the area like patchwork. And then they would report back in the command post. As soon as the sun came up, teams took advantage of the light. They began conducting linear grid searches of the vast farming region, hoping to find any sign that the girl or her unknown assailant were still in the area. FBI agent Charles Riley helped coordinate these meticulous searches. We advised teams before they left that we could find things uh, that would be evidence uh, in the case. We could find clothing, we could find anything that might relate to it. One of the problems was we didn't know what things might and might not uh, relate. So we didn't want to take a chance on bypassing anything that might be evidence and told them anything they found that might be connected to the case. Make sure they mark it, call it in. By 11 that morning, searchers had covered all the territory down to the southwest perimeter established at Highway 26. They moved south of the highway to an area with even more places for someone to hide. There were fruit tree orchards, thick brush, and wide pastures. Eight dogs, horse patrols, and searchers on foot continued to scour the challenging terrain. The area is becoming so expansive beyond the perimeter that the job of searching it would be much less thorough. And a chance of finding someone, particularly someone trying to hide from us, would be very difficult. And we weighed that against the fact that he may have escaped during the night, either through the large perimeter because it wasn't extremely tight, or was outside the perimeter before we even got it set up, and which would make the whole search for naught. Those two thoughts were pounding on us all day long. Hoping for a lead, investigators canvassed the neighborhood in Lodi where the abduction had occurred 15 hours earlier. Good afternoon. I'm Detective Since the suspect had approached the house on foot, perhaps he lived close by or had been hired by one of the neighbors to do yard work. A young fellow came around and 
They found no one who knew him. Actually, come here a minute. But several people did remember seeing the tattooed man. A young girl confirmed that she had spoken to the suspect about an hour before the abduction occurred. He had been walking through the neighborhood, targeting homes with for sale signs outside. Hi, I, like he had at the victim's sign. house. He said he was interested in buying and asked to come inside to take a look around. She refused and told him to call the realtor's number on the sign. But the scruffy man wasn't satisfied. As he continued to insist on coming in, the girl's father came in to see who his daughter was talking to. Startled, the would-be intruder quickly left the property. The daughter's description of the man exactly matched that of the other witnesses. It appeared that the drifter had been hunting for an opportunity to assault young girls, according to Lodi Police Chief Larry Hansen. It's uh, become um, a very difficult thing to realize that indeed there are people in our world who prey upon children, um, who abduct them, and who kill them, and that they're out there. They exist today as we are uh, um, living our everyday lives. There are people who are plotting to, uh, to steal someone's child. And um, it's a very frightening uh, um, dose of reality to realize that that occurs. In and around the community of Lodi, hundreds of volunteers posted flyers of the missing girl, which also included a sketch of her abductor. With the help of the Poly Class Foundation, they were able to saturate the area with over 20,000 flyers in a matter of hours. One of the leaflets finally hit home. A woman and her friend believed they recognized the sketch of the suspect. She immediately called police. The woman told a detective that she thought the man in the composite may be her 25-year-old son, Stephen Reese Cochran. From the expanded command center in the Lodi Library, an officer dispatched investigators okay. to her home to take a full statement. Okay. The woman's address was a short distance from the missing girl's neighborhood. Yes. He, in fact, uh, told his mother um, or prior to this kidnapping incident that he had a fantasy of kidnapping uh, a young girl, of having his way uh, with her, and then of killing her. And so I believe that that was a strong possibility. She said her son Stephen usually stayed at a shelter in town, but would sometimes take a bus to visit her. At about 3 o'clock on the day of the abduction, he had left her house, walking towards the neighborhood where the crime had occurred. He was wearing cut-off shorts and no shirt. The photo of her son the woman provided officers matched the sketch of the suspect. Stephen Reese Cochran had been in and out of jail for much of his 25 years. Less than two months earlier, Cochran had been released from an Arizona prison after assaulting an underage girl. The FBI assisted us in getting uh, a copy of Stephen Reese Cochran's fingerprints faxed to us. We had uh, some good crime uh, lab work from the Department of Justice. They had lifted fingerprints from inside the house. They compared them to the fingerprints of Mr. Cochran, and it was a perfect match. Police immediately released his photo to the media to alert the public. At about noon, 17 hours into the pursuit, a citizen called police to tell them that he had spotted the fugitive in a store parking lot 25 miles from Lodi. There was a young girl with him who he was screaming at to get into a vehicle. Police needed to act fast if there was any hope of rescuing the girl before she disappeared once more. More than 17 hours after a 12-year-old girl was kidnapped from her home in Lodi, California, 
Police received a report that she and her suspected abductor, Stephen Reese Cochran, had been seen in a store parking lot in the town of Manteca. Driver! When children are abducted by a stranger, their chances for survival dramatically decrease if they're not found in the first 24 hours. Exit your vehicle slowly. Face forward. Face forward. Tell us all about. Walk backwards until I tell you to stop. The tattooed man resembled the suspect. Get on your knees. And you lock your hands behind your head. But his ID showed he was not Stephen Cochran. And the young girl was his daughter, not the child who had been kidnapped. The case of mistaken identity was one of many that added to the frustrations of Lodi Police Lieutenant Gerald Murray. We had reports during the search of the suspect, which all turned out to be uh, false sightings, but still they had to be investigated and looked into, uh, which adds confusion to the whole process. By now, over 400 officers and local volunteers had joined the search in San Joaquin County, where the kidnapper had abandoned the stolen vehicle 18 hours earlier. Still, they had found no signs, no clothing, not even a footprint from the suspect or the girl. It was clear that even if the fugitive had spared the girl's life, her condition was likely deteriorating in the heat of the Northern California summer, especially if she was tied up or injured. You begin to, as time progresses, feel that obviously the worst is going to happen. Several conversations that I had with people that were there in the command post, we would sit down and discuss all these feelings and emotions and and kind of bounce them off each other, I guess, for our own mental health. And always, when we concluded that, we came with like a second wind, we would call it, another rush of hope, another thing to do, another search to organize, another step to take to make it a good outcome. At about 2 o'clock, a car approached officers stationed on a road within the two-mile-wide perimeter. The local man had been so moved by TV news reports of the missing girl that he felt compelled to do what he could to help. He had taken it upon himself to drive up and down the area road, scanning the fields for any sign of the suspect or the young girl. FBI Special Agent Charles Riley recalls that the resident's effort made a difference. The searches were still ongoing, particularly in the uh, area to the south, uh, the area around the creek and the, the heavy foliage. Uh, search was going on in that area when one of the cars going by in the road spotted a person out and it was an area where we didn't have a team of searchers. Just after the driver had left his residence, he spotted a filthy shirtless man staggering through a distant pasture. The figure had blonde hair and was wearing cut-off jean shorts as described on the news. The witness was sure it was the suspect. But the young girl was nowhere in sight. Still, after 19 hours and hundreds of acres, it was the first hope searchers had that the fugitive was still in the area. One of the officers immediately radioed the command post to alert them to the suspect's location. A speedy response was essential to confine him before he got far. As agents and detectives called on all available personnel to converge, they received another call, this one from a fish and game officer. A voice came over the radio and says, oh, we got a subject down here by the horse corrals, you know, and it's this fish and game guy who uses plain English instead of radio code. So we all just kind of froze, you know, kind of like deer in the headlights. Did I hear what I just heard? Did you say suspect or subject? I mean, subject could be anything. It could be a, somebody not even involved. Yeah, he sure looks like the guy, you know. So we're all, <laughs> little antennas go up, goosebumps and everything. So an FBI agent, uh, my sheriff's counterpart and I, we hopped in a car and we went down there.
Those who were closest responded to the remote area where a lone windmill stood next to a feeding pen for livestock. With guns drawn, three officers took positions just beyond the wide pasture. They watched silently as the tattooed man emerged from the wilderness without the child. They were able to converge and hide before the suspect crested a hill. Uh, the suspect appeared to be heading towards that area, uh, probably dehydrated and assuming he could probably get water from that area. The fugitive appeared exhausted. The police could not tell if he was still armed with a knife. Police, stop! After almost 20 hours of pursuit, authorities finally had Stephen Reese Cochran in custody. The ex-convict claimed he didn't know why he was being arrested. He said he didn't remember anything about the past 24 hours, saying he was in a drug-induced haze. When investigators asked him where the girl was, he refused to answer. For Lodi Police Chief Larry Hansen, it was a moment filled with mixed emotions. I was very relieved that we had our suspect into custody, but at the same time my heart dropped because our uh, victim was not with him. And that just really concerned me that uh, they weren't together. So I just didn't allow myself to get too caught up in the fact that we had him in custody. We still had a little girl to find. Since Cochran refused to cooperate, the girl's location and her condition remained anyone's guess. But investigators would not rest until they recovered the young girl or her body. On July 3rd, 1994, 20 hours after the search for a kidnapped California girl had begun, no. the FBI and local authorities had arrested her suspected abductor, Stephen Reese Cochran. Cochran refused to say if the girl was dead or alive, or even if she was in the remote region where he had been captured. Though the child's odds of survival in the rugged terrain did not seem likely, Lodi Police Chief Larry Hansen tried to remain hopeful most children that are abducted, uh, we either never find them or we find them and they've been killed. And as this was unfolding, I was certainly aware of that. But again, we just tried to keep positive and, and, and focus all of our attention on the belief that we were going to be able to find her. Authorities struggled with what to do next. 400 searches, 10 dog teams, and three helicopters had been searching for her since daybreak, but failed to find even the smallest shred of evidence that the girl was close by. Lodi Police Lieutenant Gerald Murray weighed the possibilities. At that particular time, we had basically two options. Attempt to follow the suspect's scent from where he was arrested back to the victim or start a line search from the fenced area along Highway 26 and just walk north and hopefully run on to wherever the victim may have been. A large group of volunteers had already assembled along the fence line near the pasture waiting for the word to proceed. Agents and detectives were concerned that if they allowed such a large group to enter the field, the throng would likely trample Evans or might even walk past the small girl without seeing her. It was a critical moment, and like the eager searchers, FBI Special Agent Charles Riley felt the urgency. You think about the families a lot, because everybody out there has a family, and, and you try to keep it professional, but it becomes part of you personally. And you relate, what if it's your sister, uh, your daughter, and you always think those things. Investigators decided that the best approach would be to use fresh dogs to trace Cochran's scent back from where he had approached the water trough. The problem was it would take the canine unit at least 30 minutes to get to the location. But the volunteers were not about to wait. I noticed several civilians going over the fence into the crime scene area. And just as I began to send somebody down to have them, ask them people to leave that area, 
um, I could hear sound and see the body language of people coming down the line from where these guys went over the fence. And there was obviously something happening, but at this particular point I couldn't distinguish what they were saying. And uh, as the sound reached me, the crowd was saying, there she is, there she is. Like an apparition, a tiny figure appeared from behind the brush. Onlookers couldn't believe their eyes. The girl was alive, stumbling toward the sound of the jubilant searchers. The detective ordered officers out into the field to meet her. When I first saw the victim coming over the hill, it was like an emotional dam had released. All the fears and worries and helplessness and hopelessness disappeared. And um, frankly, it took me about 10 minutes to get my composure and get back on track. People were high-fiving, hugging, uh, shaking our hands, congratulating, um, crying. <laughs> it's just amazing. Uh, this was really not just a law enforcement thing, but a community thing, and it really, really, really showed up at that moment, the emotion that was involved in it. The girl was taken to the hospital where she was met by her distraught parents. On the following day, July 4th, despite her 22-hour ordeal, the girl felt strong enough to escort her father, a detective and the prosecutor, to the sites where Cochran had kept her hidden during the search. She explained that to avoid detection, Cochran had camouflaged her and himself with mud. He had also forced her to lie hidden, half-submerged in the putrid water of a pond. It was too rank to drink, and she had nothing to eat for over 24 hours. Cochran kept moving, never staying in one place for very long. The girl then showed the group another hiding place. At daybreak, she said they had hidden under some straw. What happened? During the time they were at that last hiding place, um, a sheriff's deputy who was on an ATV was going along a fence line no more than 30 feet from where they were located. The victim during that time, though, even under threat of bodily harm, uh, attempted to stick her foot out of the grass area and get the attention of the deputy as he drove by, uh, but she wasn't successful. She said that at that location, she fell asleep at some point. When she awoke, Cochran no longer had his knife. Several feet away, police located the weapon that he had repeatedly held to her throat. Cochran's thumbprint was later recovered from it. We've got the weapon. Definitely. After being found mentally competent to stand trial, Stephen Reese Cochran pled guilty to 23 counts, including kidnapping, assault, burglary, and car theft. In San Joaquin County Superior Court, he was sentenced to 106 years in prison for his crimes. Even Lodi Police Chief Larry Hansen's five-year-old daughter understood the importance of this case. When it was over and I was able to go home and then finally uh, able to fall asleep, she came home later and was told that the little girl had been found. And uh, she walks down the hallway, goes to my bedroom door, kisses the door and says, thank you, daddy. And when I talk to uh, officers at conferences, I make the point that if a five-year-old girl can understand the impact of that type of a case, imagine the impact that it's going to have on your community. The successful conclusion of the case in Lodi, California, together with the legacy of Polly Class and the Foundation for Missing Children, became the models by which child abduction cases across the country are now handled. With a quick response from citizens and officials alike, communities are learning how to increase the percentages for survival when one of their own goes missing.